Okay, as we read last time, 29 and 30, this goes together. They go together, and today we are going to cover verse 30. As you can see, it starts with the conjunction and, right? Many brothers and those whom he predestined. It's a continuation from verse 29. So verse 30 has many different aspects of salvation, but we'll just go uh, take a look at it one at a time. Before we do that, let's take a look at, at different versions of uh, the Bible, the translations. Not much of variations there among these four. As I told you before, ESV and NIV, they, they don't really distinguish in this particular passage the he in terms of a pronoun used, that third person pronoun. It's using just a small h. But New King James, HCSB, and NASB, they all use the distinguishing h, big, you know, capitalized h here. So it's easier for us to follow. The benefit of this is this. If you just look at that verse, you will know, okay, he, capitalized H, means either God or Jesus. You will know. But if you look at the entire passage, though, in terms of context, by reading this, you shouldn't have a hard time to figure out who we're talking about or who Paul is referring to. Obviously, it's not us. It's not somebody, uh, Paul's uh, partner. It's more about God himself, or Christ, right? Just so you know. Yeah. <clears throat> if you look at verse 30 that we read, I'm going to read one more time. It says, And those who he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So based on this, based on this, this is continuation from the verse 28 at least. And this is the point. According to his purpose, this is what happened afterwards. Okay? So if you look at these four verbs that appears on, in verse 30, they're all indicative and aorist, meaning <clears throat> the mood-wise, it's the truth, it's reality. But the tense-wise is past tense. Glorified? Past tense? It happened already? Think about it. Right. It's interesting, isn't it? We know we're predestined, called, and justified as of today. That's for sure. Glorified at the same time? You have to think about this. Yeah. From our point of view, it doesn't make sense. Right? It didn't even happen yet. The process has started. The sanctification process is not mentioned here. But that's the process that took place. started already. But glorification we know. We will be like him. First John. That didn't take place yet. But Paul is using this grammatical consistency in terms of using these four verbs. Everything is past tense. Some people argue about the uh, error in his grammar and different approaches, but since it's indicative, he's making this statement with the full confidence. Yeah, full confidence as you prayed. That's what he's saying. Folks, this will take place as if it's done already. Interestingly, in Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament Different language, right? Hebrew is different than Greek here. But Hebrew language has a similar situation. Sometimes they were foretelling the future events. But tense, oftentimes, it's not clear. It's not saying future, it will happen. It doesn't really say that sometimes. As if it's present. Even some examples have like past tense used for future events, because God is doing it. And the authors know that will take place, that it will come to pass, because God told us that's what's going to happen, right? So Paul, maybe, uh, maybe uh, he's using the same analogy in this sense. Instead of using it, will be glorified, he said, we're already glor glorified. 
Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> so for this order of salvation captured in verse 30, I want to take a look at these verses together. Okay? I know it's not going to be easy to go back and forth, but let's take a look at the Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and 5 first. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. <clears throat> Actually, we can read from verse 3. 3, 4, and 5 from Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, 3, 4, and 5. Are you ready? Go. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the omnipotent, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that He should be holy, blameless before Him, in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. Okay, stop right there. So that's the predestination part. Okay, He did it because... A lot of times people think of this way. Okay, He predestined us to do this and do that and praise His glory, uh, to be a partaker of this fellowship with other people, be like Jesus. <clears throat> different reasons and different things happen here and there. He predestined us means, actually, He loved us. That's what it means. And it will make sense later on. So I just want to give you that little hint. He loved us so we can be like this. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to explain to you later, but just, just keep that in mind. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> hmm. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let's read from verse 13, 13 and 14, okay? 13 and 14. Ready? Go. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved, though communication by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 13 has a great explanation there. He says, Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. In the truth. Verse 14 says, To this He called you through our gospel. Think about it. <clears throat> a lot of people today they say, they claim that they were called by God in vision and different methodologies. That could happen if God wants to do that, right? But in most cases, we're called by the gospel message. This is what Paul is saying. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Bible says clearly, it's not about vision that Paul went through. It's not about walking on the water, just like Peter did. It's about the gospel. That's the only way, the major way, to call people out of this world. Yeah. So you have to have this years to year uh, to hear the gospel message properly. Yeah, a lot of times people just think it's, uh, it's, a, it's boring to listen to the message. The same, same message a lot of times, right? Same thing over and over again. But Paul mentioned that many times in his Bible, the same message, and especially Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 says, it's good for you to listen to the same message over and over again. Yeah. Even Paul mentioned it to this audience back in the first century. I believe they're com complaining about that too. How come you're telling us the same thing all the time, Paul? He says, it's beneficial for you. It's beneficial for you. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. There was calling process through the gospel. That's clear in Thess Thessalonians. Let's take a look at the fellowships portion of it. First Corinthians chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one verse nine. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter one verse nine. Let's read them together. Ready? Go. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah. The fellowship is, first of all, with God Himself. A lot of times when we use the word fellowship, we automatically think about fellowship with other people people around us, and which is fine, yeah, which is fine, that's important. So in church, we have to have a fellowship with other believers. But the first priority falls upon the fellowship with the Son, Christ Jesus. Problem is, unless you are born again, you cannot have this privilege to have this fellowship with Christ. Yeah. So people can come to church, but they don't really have this inner joy or they don't really have this um, re uh, rejoicing heart in themselves because they truly haven't had a chance to meet with Jesus through the gospel message. A lot of people are called, but just few are chosen, right? So a lot of people listen to the message, but if it doesn't click until that happens, they cannot participate in this fellowship, amazing fellowship. Yeah. In fact, we had two of you uh, who got baptized uh, two weeks, no, last week. Yeah, last week. Only a week ago. Yeah. That's a, that's a great way of celebrating our fellowship. And that's a sign that, okay, we are partaking in fellowship with Christ as well as with you guys and church. They're officially the body of Christ. Not because of the baptism, but because of their faith that they have. Yeah. That's why they went through the baptism and officially publicly announcing or proclaiming their faith in front of everyone. So fellowship is the next section. Glorification, let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> Let's look at it from verse 11. Verse 11. Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12. Ready? Go. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. It's a glorification that's coming promise, but still, it is encouraging you to walk in the manner worthy of your calling. The sanctification has to take place. A lot of people think, okay, since I'm saved, then I'll be just glorified later on, going to heaven. Everything will be fine. There's a process, though. Once you're called and chosen, then you will grow in spirit until the glorification takes place. It's not a jumping, uh, you can jump the step, you cannot do that. The step is there. You are going to have this fellowship in Christ, fellowship with other Christians, and as you do it in spirit, through the scripture, you will grow spiritually. And then finally, what, we, what they call consummation of this salvation process is the glorification. We'll be like Christ. 
that doesn't mean we will become Christ, right? We'll be like Him. We'll be like Him. Yeah. So, let's, uh, yeah. People have this uh, issue, right? Predestination is a really hard concept, and the word itself appears in the Bible. So we cannot skip that word and not explain it. Oh, it's just a hard concept. Only God knows that's true. But we have to explain as much as we can based on the scripture. In churches today, in many churches, there are always two groups of people. One group firmly believes that predestination is it. The other group says, you know, I, I, I understand, but there's something that we should do, or my part is there as part of it, right? In a way, that statement is not false either. Because the Bible tells you you have to do a lot of stuff. It's not just you're saved and you don't have to do anything. So that's a little bit different. I'm gonna <laughs> so let me tell you this, though. Some people who argue about predestination, they say this. If, if, if they are Christians, right? Yeah, but I have my part and their part, and that's the thing that bothers me. Two ways we can say, they, even though they're not saying that they're not completely agreeing with their head, they agree with the predestination concept. Two ways. At least two examples we can see. One is this. <clears throat> Sometimes they thank God for something happens, right? And they work really hard, but they got the promotion. If they're a Christian, what, who do they thank to? God, right? Thank God for allowing me to get this good promotion, or whatever have you. Right? They acknowledge without telling the predestination or God's sovereignty. God does everything. They acknowledge that in that sense. God is the one who's doing everything for them in their lives. Another way is this. When they're trying to evangelize somebody, they fail to evangelize someone. They say, well, you know, I don't do Jesus. So, okay. If you really care for that person, what do they do? They pray to God to work in their hearts. Meaning, they acknowledge God's sovereignty there too. It's not them. They know God does everything. That God has to touch and change that person's heart. And that's the only way they'll be converted. So both ways, they actually acknowledge God's sovereignty, which is the closely related to the predestination. It's not about us. We're not causing anything. God is in control of everything. Yeah. Any questions on this part? No? Not yet? It's going to get better, so let's take a look at this. <clears throat> As you can see, verse 30 was about predestination all the way from the beginning to the end. Let me read that one more time for you. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Again, in here, he is God himself. Right? So he does everything. He pre predestined them, this particular group. He called them. He justified them. He glorified them. All the way. What have we done? Nothing. We didn't volunteer for anything. Some people have some misunderstanding about the predestination. Okay, I am predestined. I am saved. You're not. Yeah. A lot of people feel that way when we talk about predestination. It happened to me uh, f a few times, a few years ago, a long time ago actually. And when I explained to, uh, this concept to the small group of people, one person asked me, so are you saying you're predestined to be saved? I'm not sure about this. That means I'm not saved. So you're better than me? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. So whenever they hear this predestination, they feel like, <clears throat> okay, 
Okay, they, he's arrogant. You know, he thinks he's saved, but I don't have that confidence, so I feel bad about this. But that's not what it is. When you actually understand the predestination properly, that means you did not deserve to be saved. You don't deserve to be saved. You didn't do anything. You cannot be arrogant. You have to kind of explain to them, no, it's not about me, it's about God. So it makes us, if, any, if anything happens to me, it makes me more humble. Because in fact, I'm nothing, right? In that sense. You cannot be arrogant in any sense, okay? So when you explain this concept, hard concept, in any Bible study uh, settings, just try to be, um, I mean, you don't have to fake, but you have to be humble about this. It's not something, yeah, we're saved, and they, they're not saved. You cannot really say that that way. So next item is uncertainty. Okay, if God chose everyone, if God predestined somebody, how do we know then if I'm saved? Right? I'm not sure about this. At the end of the day, I mean, if God says, I didn't choose you, what are you going to do? That we have this uh, suspense and uncertainty throughout our, our, our lives. Is that going to be the case? You don't have to wait, raise your hands, but if you truly hear the message right and then you believe that predestination is it, would you feel the same way, that uncertainty? What if, what if, right? I'm not chosen. People argue about this uncertainty because of the predestination concept. Let me put it this way. <clears throat> in this world, we have two groups of people in this world, not in church. In church, maybe the same thing. In this world, believers and unbelievers, right? <clears throat> unbelievers do not care about the predestination. In fact, they don't care about God, period. Unbelievers would not have uncertainty about predestination, for sure. All right? So, how about believers? Depends on how you, how you define believing in this sentence. If you truly believe God is sovereign, meaning He's, in, he's controlling, He's in control of everything, and based on that, if you believe in the predestination concept, you shouldn't have this uncertainty. You cannot. I use this analogy sometimes, but I don't know, when you are younger and smaller, I mean, Stephen's told than us, so I cannot really hold his hand, still let's go, I cannot do that anymore. When he was little, yeah, I was able to hold him with my one hand, right, one arm. Think about it, when you're little, you're walking on the street with your dad. When you're little, or mom. Yeah, mothers are strong too, you know, I would say, right? So when you're little, they're strong. Your parents are very strong and steady. So when you're walking on the street, when you stumble on something and then fall, a lot of times they're holding your hands. They're your hand. They are. So a lot of times, not because you're holding their hand, because they're holding your hand, you don't really fall a lot of times. Right? You lose your grip but they're still holding your hand. Yeah. Of course, some kids kind of fell apart and then just fall on the ground, but usually your parents can save you from there. Right? That's a confidence. So when your parents, mother or father, hold your hand when you're little, walking on the street, wherever you go, you feel good, you feel confident. Yeah. You don't think even... Um, that car going around the street, they cannot even hit me because my father is right here, or my mother is right here. Yeah. When I was little, I remember I was, I don't know, four or five, I guess. I was across the street with my father, like a regular road. Back in the old days, the Korea 
they didn't really have a good signal light system. So you just have to go across the jaywalking, basically. <laughs> you have to do that. And my father, now I know, he's passed, right? But he's only, what, 5'3"? He's not that tall. I was very small. And he was holding my hand and going across the street. And then whenever cars come in, he's like this. Cars stop. I said, wow, my father is just amazing. <laughs> he's all powerful. He can stop the car. They listen to his direction, right? <laughs> they stop. Yeah. Little did I know they're supposed to stop anyway. But anyway, so that confidence, wow, I'm holding my dad's you know, hand. Same thing. You, you are a believer. You, you know who God is, and He's holding you through this process, and He's going to glorify you. He's faithful. Then uncertainty shouldn't take place in your heart because you are trusting Him. Your trust and your hope is in Him, not in you. Right? So you shouldn't have this uncertainty in your heart. I'm not talking about self-inflicted or self-like generated confidence. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the confidence in Christ through the Scripture with God's spiritual power. Okay? That's what I'm referring to. So don't, don't ever feel uncertain about your salvation. That's going to that's gonna really uh, prevent you from growing spiritually. If that always bothers you, you cannot really grow. Yeah, it's really tough to grow. Complacency and antinomians. Complacency is what? Yeah. God saved me so I don't have to do anything. Moral laws? What moral law? I mean, you don't have to do anything. I mean, I can break this. Thing. I can do, I can behave a little bit bad. I'm still saved. <clears throat> that's one of those um, myths that people uh, think that's going to take place. Again, that's one of the main reasons why the Wesley, he went on with their Methodist uh, doctrine. Because if you just truly teach the predestination all the time, God's sovereignty, then people will be lazy with that confidence. And John Wesley said, that's not right. We got to have this, develop this system so we can work hard, uh, have this discipline on our own as a spiritual person which is a good concept, we, which we all have to do that, the, right? But you cannot deny predestination with your methodology, all right? It's not like co-equal status. God's sovereignty is way above everything, yeah. So this one doesn't work either. You cannot be lazy Christian. You cannot be law-breaking Christian. You shouldn't be, yeah. People make mistakes, right? I'm not, again, I'm not talking about the perfection here. But you cannot be breaking the law. I mean, if you don't, even if you don't believe in predestination, you still can't do it. <laughs> right, you shouldn't do that, right? Right, so as a law-abiding citizen, you shouldn't break the law anyway. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Or be lazy. Or be lazy, right? That's not a virtue in any standard. Yeah, I don't remember any reading uh, from any culture saying, in our culture, laziness is a virtue. No, I, didn't, I never heard such a thing. Yeah. Not a good thing. Yeah. Forget about it. So, <clears throat> Narrow-mindedness, right? Since we're predestined to be saved, we're chosen, we're elected, I just have to take care of myself. Yeah, who knows? That person is not really saved. I don't know. And evangelism, God takes care of everything, so I don't have to do that either. Because God knows who's going to be saved. It's only me. Me, my church, my family. Yeah. However, that shouldn't be the case either. 
a lot of people argue this point too. Then if God determined everything, why evangelize? You know, what's the point of going, uh, sending those missionaries and what's the point? R.C. Sproul said, yeah? Right. So R.C. Sproul basically answered that question in his lecture. Because the Bible says so. You know, we have to do that. Yeah, you have to evangelize people. Uh, be a witness, right? So if you truly believe sovereign God, and God is your master, then you've got to listen to Him. Because the Bible says that. The simple answer. On top of that, Bible also emphasizes your works. After you're saved, that's the verse that we use all the time. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 talks about our salvation through faith in Christ, which is gift. We cannot boast about anything. It's not from our work. Verse 10 says, though, we are created to do good works in Christ. So as a natural progress of saved person, you have to do a good work. What's the good work? Buying somebody lunch? That's a good one too. Good work is spreading the good news, the gospel message. That's the ultimate good work. Yeah. Right, right. And God doesn't take our life away, which basically means we are representing who He is. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes down to us glorifying God. <coughs> right. While we are alive and having breath, mm -hmm. that's basically what we represent. And right. our body is glorifying <coughs> God. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yeah. And what Michael uh, mentioned is, um, Jinso, you, you went through that too. The catechism first question is our ultimate purpose of life is to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever, enjoy the fellowship in Him forever. Right. Yeah. Something to do. <clears throat> right, right. So Michael's point is again, this this is the point. If God's ultimate purpose is just to save us, then as soon as we become Christian, we don't have reason to stay here. But since we're get, waking up every morning, doing something, meeting some people, working, going to school, coming to church, there's a reason why He left us here. There's a mission that we have to accomplish as Christians, right? God uses people to accomplish His goals too. A lot of times, right? The good example is Moses. Did God really need Moses to part the Red Sea? No. But He used them in Exodus, right? He didn't have to use them. Mm -hmm. I think that enriches our soul. Right. If God, God mm -hmm. can create any perfect being if He wants to create. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, mm -hmm. then we shouldn't really go through this process. Of right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, predestination or not, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a small portion of what it is. Yeah. So, let me. Okay, that's good. Good thought. While I'm listening to you, I was thinking about this. Okay, a little bit different. It's really an uh, inferior example, but I'm going to give you this example, okay? I know Stevens played soccer, and uh, so you have competitions. Some people are involved with the sports activities or competition coming up. So we have some, some game coming, right? That's our goal. We have this tournament coming up next month, for example. What do we have to do between now and then? Since we are going to have this game, let's just be prepared. Let's clean up our uniform. 
and how to get there, direction and all that. That's all we do while we're waiting for that game to take place. Practice. You gotta practice. Be careful. Yeah, some people like it, but most of you, I don't think you, do you guys enjoy practice? Like before a soccer game, I wanna practice more, like dribbling and then, hey, did you enjoy practicing more than the game, Stephen? No. I don't think I, I prefer practice either. I mean, practice is no fun. A lot of times you repeat the same thing over and over again. It's just like no end results. You just practice all the time. So that's the thing. Practicing has to take place, which is no fun a lot of times. But if you enjoy practicing, though, you, if you actually enjoy practicing, you'll do well in your game you are going to do above and beyond what's required in your practice. Christian living, same thing. We know we are saved. We're going to heaven. Then guess what? A lot of times, things that you see around you doesn't really matter. Then you will be able to have this joy that we're talking about all the time in the Bible. What joy? You know? When you look around my life, it's a lot of headaches and things are not working out. I'm not happy, right? You cannot live like that as a Christian. You cannot. Because the end result is right there. God's glorifying work is already in taking place in you. Then you will have a different perspective about your life. Yeah. Let's say, let's say it's game day, right? Next month. But for the past five months, they said, okay, we're going to have a game next month. But two weeks after, they said, well, game has been canceled. All right. Three weeks later, okay, game's going to take place next month this time. All right. Three weeks later, game has been canceled. It's been canceled for four or five times. Then what would you do next time? Somebody says, game will take place next month. I'm not going to practice. How do I know if it's going to happen this time? But we know what God told us will take place because He's faithful. With that confidence, that glory, verse 18, right? Chapter 8, verse 18 says, Our suffering today is not comparable to the glory in the future. That's what it is. If you truly see that coming, and that's yours to take and participate in that glory and fellowship, then today's suffering or hard time that you're going through shouldn't bother you, bother you too much. It bothers you, skip 1 through 10. It bothers you now like 7. As you get sanctified, it shouldn't bother you as much, maybe 4, 2. That's the sanctification process. You don't react, respond to the same issue the same way. You're growing mature in maturity spiritually, then you're handling situation differently. Yeah. Sometimes I lose my temper. Sometimes, right, Joseph? Once a year, maybe. But anyway, but it happens. We're we're not again becoming a perfect person because we're Christ and in Christ. But we are getting better. We're getting better. And not because we have to practice. No, with, not with that mindset. We are enjoying this practice. That's why a lot of people in this world would not understand our lifestyles. From their point of view, it's a boring life. No fun. In a secular way. But we have this joy. That's why people are, how come they're different? They may wonder about our lives. They should, because it's different. Um, <clears throat> Mark Edmondson, the Why Teach book, he mentioned this one, right? Today's college kids, they're never satisfied with whatever they have. They have to get a new phone and new things all the time. And they're partying all the time. I think he's referring to his school, like Jinu is attending right now. They start this 
party like th as early as thir Thursday night because a lot of times you don't have much uh, class on set at Friday. So f Thursday night or even Friday for sure, they start partying. You know what they do in their party? There's so many parties taking place around campus area. You, you go to one party and what do they do? They're texting each other to the people in a different party. How's your party? Oh, I should've been there. So they don't, they don't enjoy their party, but they wanna go somewhere else. That's all they do, right? If you cannot enjoy life today, if you cannot glorify God today, don't think of yourself glorifying Him or enjoying Him down the road someday. Yeah, after I graduate from college, after I start making good money, then I can become a better Christian then. Do you really think so? I highly doubt people, I mean, God will work in them if they change. It doesn't matter where in your stage of life, you will change. Then you are going to be a different person. But a lot of people say, I'm going to do this later. I'm going to do this 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Usually it doesn't happen. I still know this person, couple. They don't even have children. They're like uh, lawyer and then business people, right? They have like multiple businesses. They're making big bucks. They've been saying it to me for, for the past 20 years or so. If we make enough money, what? You're making so much money anyway. If we make enough money and save enough money, then we will go uh, uh, as a missionary somewhere. For the past 20 years, they've been expanding their business, <laughs> making big bucks, you know, getting a new house and whatever have you, but they haven't done anything yet, as far as I'm concerned. They're older than me too, so I don't know when they're going to do what they said they're going to do. They always say that, oh yeah, for the glory of God, we'll do this, we'll do that. We will do this, right? Not like, I am doing this, I've done that. There's nothing to share with that kind of people. But don't be like them, okay? Don't become like that kind of people. No, lip service is not a service. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he just mentioned lip service is not a service at all. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, in summary, John Stott, great theologian um, who passed a few years ago, he said this, two bullet points here. Let's read this together, okay? The doctrine of divine predestination, actually it promotes these um, elements. Let's read them together. Ready? Go. Promotes humility, not arrogance. Assurance, not apprehension. Responsibility, not apathy. Holiness, not complacency. And mission, not privilege. It's something we have to think about. It's going to make us humble. It's, it's going to make us have this confidence, right? Assurance in Christ. We're going to be more responsible for our role as Christian in this world because we know for sure we're going to heaven, right? We're going to be holy. We're trying to be holy because God is holy. Yeah, God is holy. A mission, right? We're trying to witness the gospel to the people as much as we can instead of enjoying our own privilege. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. Good for me. Yeah. If I apply this to myself, what happens? I can study. I can enjoy my Bible study from school. And I don't have to share anything with anyone. I just enjoy my own study. And that's it. Yeah. My family, that's it, right? But I'm sharing this at church. Whoever I meet, I discuss these things. All right, exactly. So I can't do that either. You're right. Um, <laughs> I have to work, and in the workplace, I have some conversations with my coworkers too. Somebody asked me this. I didn't. I don't know what that means really. But <clears throat> one one lady uh, past week, in the past week, he, she asked me. So Peter. 
you have brothers and yeah, are they all like religious like you? I said, no. <laughs> Am I religious? I said, yeah. In what sense? And she said all those things. So the way she observed me is a little bit different, I guess. Yeah. So you got to hear that. You don't have to hear that. I mean, for the sake of hearing it, do something differently. But people will know that you're a Christian. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's the thing, the mission. Wherever you go, whatever you do, some people become jealous about you because you, go, you don't get, become shaky when things happen. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to lose my mind, but you're okay. You're calm and in peace, and then what's going on with this person? They wonder about you because you're different. <clears throat> okay, this little disclaimer here, right? He's saying this is not to claim that there are no problems, but to indicate that they are more intellectual than pastoral. It's not just spiritually, okay, this is what happens, guys, it's okay, all right? It's not like this. You can actually think about this, and it makes sense. <clears throat> he acknowledges there's an issue. Predestination versus our role. It never really reconciles completely. But we all know what God said will take place. And we all know what we say a lot of times in most cases, they don't happen, right? So that's the difference. That's the difference. Don't have too much confidence in you, but have confidence in Christ. All right. So I have a little long conclusion, but we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you have actual Bible, chapter 7 subtitle is, what does it say? A chosen people. Okay. All right. What have been chosen? I decided, no, God chose them. Old Testament, same thing. New Testament, same thing. God chose Israel. God chose believers. God chose his people. Verse 6, verse 6. So since you believe that uh, predestination, this is what I'm going to say, right? Moses, um, basically a sermon here. Verse 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Think about this, guys. God chose us. Back in the old days, that was Israel directly. God chose us to be for his treasured possession. It's not just a possession, treasured possession. Very valuable possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Think about this concept again. God chose Israel out of every other nation. At the time of selection or election, People could complain too. Why Israel? What have, they, what have they done? Are they different than us? They're better than us? Why not Korean people? Right? And that answer is here. Moses answered his own question and other people's question actually. Verse 7 here. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love anew and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. So that means you didn't have much to offer, but God chose you anyway. Because he loved you. Again, verse 7 says, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love anew and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. Verse 8 but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of 
Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Let me just finish there. Verse 8 says, But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers. The reason God chose you is because God loves you. If we, and He kept His oath, promise that He made with his, uh, uh, Israel's fathers. Think about this. If we apply to our predestination concept we learned today, He predestined us to be justified and glorified later on because, not because what I did, not because I'm stronger than other people, because He loved us. That's why He chose, chose us. Okay? The point is, predestination is not about who did what and all that. No. The point is, God loved us, and that's why He chose us out of all people. Make sense? With that love, with that love, if you realize that love upon you, then your life will be different. Because we don't deserve to be saved. Israel's didn't deserve to be saved or selected by God either. They didn't have good numbers. They were not really that good. But God chose them because He loved them. Yeah. Abraham is the same situation. If you look at all the people who are chosen by God, basically it's driven by God's love for them, including us, if you're Christians. Okay? Any questions?